Welcome to The Power Is Now. My name is Eric Frazier. The 1968 Fair Housing Act was a game changer. April 11th, 1968, hundreds of cities caught on fire, riots, and all kinds of things ensued uh, that led to President uh, Johnson to signing this bill into law. Many believe that uh, it was only signed into law just to keep us quiet, to calm us down. And that the law, in effect, didn't really have any power to make the kind of changes that uh, we were all hoping uh, would be realized. And so we're asking the question today, uh, is the 1968 Fair Housing Act living up to its uh, goals and aspirations? Uh, do we need the 1968 Fair Housing Act still and all the amendments that have happened thereafter? Uh, what can we do to make it more effective and to get more buy-in from real estate professionals and lenders and, and consumers who may desire to discriminate or in any way uh, try to block minorities from purchasing homes in their neighborhood or, or renting homes? Today, we have Leon Townsend, who is a president of the California Association of Black uh, real estate uh, professionals. Uh, he's the president-elect. And Dolores Golden, who is the president of the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals, to talk with us about the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Welcome, Leon and Dolores, to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, I know you're very busy full-time real estate professionals, as well as volunteering officers of a trade association. So I know what that means. Now, before we get into our very important topic today, I, I want to ask you a question that we ask all of our guests. It's a tradition here on The Power Is Now. And that is, what does the phrase, the power is now, mean to you in the context of who you are, what you do professionally? And since we're talking about fair housing, let's start with you, Dolores. Well, the power is now, because you know, Eric, I've known you for a very long time, so I'm familiar with the power is now. And at the time when you started it, I thought that is right on. The power is now. And now after the unconscionable beating and killing of Floyd, we all were woke. And the power again is now, especially for black people. If we don't take the power that is right now in our hands, we will never get it again. We see it with gentrification. As a realtor, Black realtors are going to be extinct in a minute because of gentrification. And because the people that are coming to America don't speak English and they want someone comfortable in their own language. So the people that are coming to California is going to be totally different in the next 20 years. And we will be extinct if we don't take the power is right now and take charge. Dolores, you know, I totally understand what you're saying. The immigration to California uh, from other states and countries is about 25% of the population. And in fact, I was reading the other day that they're predicting that California will go from 40 million, which it is currently, to 50 million by 2050. And uh, about 75% of that growth is gonna come from Californians having babies, but a significant number is gonna happen through immigration. So uh, we definitely do need to seize the power that we have now uh, so that we can be relevant in the future. So absolutely. Great power is now statement. Leon, can you top that? No, but um, <laughs> I could definitely- The younger you, version. <laughs> I can give you my perspective. Um, you know, you, you know, like Dolores mentioned, you, you know, you, the, everything that's happened after George Floyd was kind of of an igniter. And I think that, you know, realizing what that statement of power is now means is that 
there's no better time to realize the change and capabilities that you have, not only on a small scale, but a large scale, better than today, right? If you realize it tomorrow or Sunday, you're a day too late. You'll still be trying to catch up from realizing what you have today. So you want change, you want things to happen, you want to maintain relevancy. It all starts now with you and you know who you align yourself with and what you believe in and you know withstanding change and things that are happening like you you know you both mentioned gentrification and immigration you know realizing that the only person that can really stop you is you so just realizing that you have all the power is you know kind of to me a like you know, kind of like an inspiration thing. And when and it comes to fair housing, you know, the power is now. Like we realize things have to change. They've, you know, they should have changed 54 years ago, you know, and as we get into later, question is, has the power of this act really changed our situation? That is the question, Leon. Uh, thank you for your power is now statement. And you're absolutely right. The power is within us, right? We have to do our part uh, to see the change we want to see in the world. Uh, again, good. I really appreciate you both taking time out of your busy schedule to join me today uh, to talk about this very important topic. And um, before we get into the organizations that you represent, uh, tell me a little bit more about your profession. Your, In fact, let's start with you, Dolores. You are a seasoned, well-established real estate broker. Uh, share with our audience a little bit about your company, how long you've been in business, where you're, where you're located. Thank you, Eric. Well, my company is First Interstate Realtors. A lot of people go into business and they want to have their own name on the company. But when I started in 1990, I wanted my company to have a bigger image. And I had relatives in other states. So I was thinking, well, maybe we could be the first interstate real estate company across the globe, but that didn't happen. So I'm still here in Culver City, California, which is centrally located. I'm close to Inglewood, Compton, Beverly Hills, you name it. I'm just 30 minutes, within 30 minutes away. So I'm close to everything. I've been in business as my own broker since 1990. And when I started, I had about 30 agents working for me, and now we're down to a basic seven. Seven is the magic number. And uh, all my agents are experienced. We list and sell real estate property. And unfortunately, I'm the queen of probate. <laughs> it's, I cringe at the probate. So that's another thing we're trying to do with our volunteer organizations is uh, make the community aware that you need to get a trust. And you need to trust your relatives and make sure if you get a reverse mortgage that they know about it. If they're gonna be your health care provider, they need to know what kind of situation your home is in. So we have been in business a long time because we care about the community. I'm not up here on TV selling gazillion dollar properties. You know what's down the street. I love selling property to people that are happy when I give them the keys. Their whole family is happy. They have smiles on their faces. It's not just, oh, it's another property and pass the peas and move on. So that's why I've been in business so long because I love what I'm doing. Hopefully I'll follow in the footsteps of Ted Lumpkin. He was doing real estate until he was 100 and passed away earlier this year, but he was still live and active and driving his car and had a pen that he could sign a contract. So that's my goal. Well, uh, I am I'm rooting for you. I, I want you to achieve that goal. Uh, we need seasoned, you know, professional, uh, highly intelligent, educated, black real estate professionals serving our community and the community at large. So thank you again for sharing your background. Leon, tell us a little bit about your company and your role actually with the organization. Yeah, so um, I'm currently at Comfort Real Estates. It's a minority owned real estate brokerage that is in LA County and Ventura County. Um, I've only been in the business since the great year of 2015. 
Um, so that's going on seven years in September. It will officially be seven years. Um, I might have got a couple gray hairs in the beard just from all the things I've experienced in these seven years. Um, so for me, it's um, my passion and my drive is that home ownership number that everybody you know reads about and hears about every year. My goal is to up that. So I like working with first time home buyers um, in the LA County area. There's not really an area that I don't go to. Um, I just feel like honestly, it doesn't matter where someone, you know, owns a property. It's about owning the property. You know, it's not about if you're in Riverside or if you're in, you know, La Cunada or if you're in Carson. It's about having your name on that title at the end of the day. And to me, that's the main important thing. You know, I would love to be, you know, in this business till I'm 100. Um, if I do my calculations right, I have about 66 years and a month left to do this till I'm 100. So I'm going to try and get there as best as possible. Well, um, I'm rooting for you as well. I know you can do it. <laughs> now, Leon, uh, since you are the president and elect, uh, why don't we start with you to talk about the mission uh, and vision of the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals. And, and let's also draw the distinction here between the California Association of Real Estate Brokers and the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals. Yeah. So I'm going to paraphrase our mission statement. Um, so our mission um, at Cobra or the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals is our goal is to create mold and bring about Black you know, realtors as leaders in the California Association of Realtors. So that's our main goal. Um, you know, we want to make sure that they're doing not only what's best for themselves or brokers in the industry, but they're doing what's best for the community as well. So, you know, like Ms. Loris mentioned, mentioned, you know, making sure and ensuring that they're, you know, have the access to trust and wills, you know, that also maintains, you know, that home ownership number that we're focused on as well as our leadership capabilities. Um, for those who, you know, aren't really active in the California Association of Realtors, um, when, you know, before I came on board, you know, you really only heard about a small amount of Black leaders. Now that number has been increasing because, you know, they're getting exposure, they're getting opportunities to show what they're capable of. And at a leadership quality, not only, you know, in, you know, the state meetings, but also in their own brokerages, in their own local associations, in their own communities. So it's, you know, the real distinction there is that we are completely separate. We are a nonprofit. So, you know, we do have our own 501c3 status, but our goal is to not only help and mold leaders, but to help them become leaders in their own community. Thank you for sharing that, um, Leon. Um, you know, there has been historically a lack of leadership in the California Association of Realtors and, you know, a, a lack of real cooperation with other minority trade associations, associations as well. Uh, so Dolores, can you speak to you know, what your current goal is as president? What's, what's your agenda, if you will, uh, as you close out your term for this uh, new young buck that's coming up behind you? Happy to have him on board, very happy. And that was part of our goal. When Actually, when we started our organization, we called it the BBC, the Black Business Caucus, because we would meet after meetings at restaurants or bars and get together about what happened during the day at our CAR meetings. And the funny thing is that when I first met Eric a thousand years ago, we were the only two black people in the room at a California Association of Realtors event. That evening, they give a realtor party event. And Eric and I were the only two black people in the room. So imagine every time I go to a meeting, down the halls, all I see is five other black people and I could name them. And it was so bad that I could ask a, a, a white friend of mine, have you seen so-and-so? And they say, oh yeah, they just went that way. <laughs> That's how bad it was. So when we formed, we formed, and just like Leon said, to increase 
leadership within the CAR organization, and we have done it. I can't tell you how many, because I didn't bring the count with me, maybe Leon knows, but we have chairs of committees now and vice chairs of committees that important committees that we have never had before. It's amazing. And because of that, I hope that that was the reason that we gave uh, commitment and back backup to people. We have a lot of women that are now pr president of their Women's Council of Realtor chapter, black women that we have never seen before. And we also have women leaders that we have never seen before. The Greater LA Association of Realtors has a black treasurer, Tony English, who is also the treasurer of our group. You've never seen that before. So we are accomplishing my goals, which is our goals. And we're increasing. And the other part of that flip was most of us five people that you saw all the time were older black people. And we wanted to bring young people along and help mentor and give them backup so that they can excel and rise above that glass ceiling and crack it. And we've done that. So that's what we want. We wanna be able to not retire from real estate, but retire from doing 25 different volunteer jobs. So welcome aboard, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dolores, uh, having been a member of CAR and being involved in the organization, as well as KRAP, uh, as well as NARAP, I know you know firsthand how challenging it is to volunteer your time uh, in real estate associations and at the same time run a business. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a serious commitment. So I, I take my hat off to both of you uh, for the work you're doing. And it's so good to see a car, and not just car, we have to give NARA some credit as well mm -hmm. for their efforts towards increasing diversity in leadership. I had the privilege and honor to meet Farrah Wilder. She oh, uh, joined yes. us last year, and uh, we talked about the Fair Housing Act. In fact, she's going to be joining us again this year, hopefully, uh, before we end this series. Uh, and I'm so happy they have someone who is really bringing a focus on diversity and inclusion uh, in the California Association of Realtors, and that uh, they have created this, you know, Black real estate professionals uh, uh, division. Is it a division? What exactly? It is a trade association within the larger association, correct? No, actually, we're separate. We're just are on our own. We're a 501c3 nonprofit created by us for us. Now they did approve of it and loved it. And like I said, we were in that Floyd generation where everybody got woke. So they were really happy and very happy to encourage and, and make us part of their organizational meetings, which was a first. Cause like I said before, we were meeting in the shadows we were meeting in bars and restaurants at night in a private room so nobody would see us because when more than six of us got together, they didn't want to join. Oh, what are you drinking? Let's join you. Because that's the way we roll. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be a part of it. So we had to separate in order to get our stuff together and organize and be our own entity. So we're our own entity. And most so of us belong to NARAP. Right. So right. there you go. So you have NARAP, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. You have KRAP, which is a state chapter under NARAP. Uh, and then you now have the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals. So um, is there a reason why this organization is not under KRAP or NARAP as opposed to its own entity? Because you're saying you're not even under CAR, right? Right. Because we formed in order to create leadership, Black leadership within CAR. I see. And that's why it's separate. So it just so happens that most of us, just like most of us belong to the NAACP, most of us belong to NARAP and KRAP. That's right. So it's, you know, it's your black calling card. It's your backbone. But it's totally different because NARAB, which I applaud that mission of the house first, then the car. Because with our right. black people, that's a major problem. 
Anybody can buy a car as long as you have the money, but everybody couldn't buy a house. And now we need to make sure the young America understands that we didn't always have that right. It's a privilege and you need to take advantage of it by anything, buy you a piece of land in Palmdale if that's what it takes to start, but start. But that's why we're separate because it can't be the same. It's totally different mission. Yes, a focus on leadership, um, bringing up leadership, establishing leadership within exactly. the California Association of Realtors. Thank you so much, uh, Dolores and Leon, uh, for shedding light on the organization, your careers. For those of you who are joining us, we are talking to Dolores Golden, who is the president of the California Association of Black Real Estate Professionals, and Leon Townsend, who is the president-elect. Uh, we're going to be talking about the 1968 Fair Housing Act, and so far, we've got a chance to get to know them, uh, what they're all about. And next up is April. April is Fair Housing Month, and um, there's a lot happening across the country uh, in talking about fair housing, particularly the Act, the 1968 Act. And so that's what we're going to do next. You're listening to The Power Is Now television podcast, and you may be even reading the magazine. Go to thepowersnow.com and check us out. We'll be right back right after this commercial break. Want to keep up with the current developments happening in the world of real estate? The Real Estate Roundtable, hosted by Eric L. Frazier, is a show you do not want to miss. The show features a panel of VIP agents who are passionate about helping people. It is what they do best. They discuss today's hot topics, latest market updates and trends. The panel also conducts interviews with prominent figures in the industry. New episode every Friday live on Facebook and replay on the Power Is Now YouTube channel. And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to The Power Is Now. We're talking about the 1968 Fair Housing Act, and I have Dolores Golden, who is the president of the California Association of uh, the Black Real Estate Professionals, and Leon Townsend, who is the president-elect, to talk about the 1968 Fair Housing Act, its importance, what we can do to make it, you know, to make it better. Is still uh, discrimination a problem, particularly for African Americans? Uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, April is Fair Housing Month. What is your organization doing to promote fair housing? Let's start with you. Uh, Homeownership 365 is, you know, our initiative to, you know, pretty much say, you know, being a homeowner is 365 days out of the year. Every day is a step that you need to take to get towards home, you know, owning a home as well as maintaining ownership. So um, last year we started a series where we would have experts come in. Um, we had Lori Gay, who is part of, you know, neighborhood housing. She's the CEO. So she would talk about, you know, programs that help, you know, with down payment assistance in certain areas, grants that, you know, are offered. You know, we've had financial advisors and professionals come in talking about the importance of trust and wills and you know, how to consistently keep up with that. You know, do you need to have someone come in every year? You know, what's the difference between a living trust and a living will? Which one transfers things over? Which one is, you know, consistent and permanent to you leave this earth? You know, what is easier for, you know, your heirs to get that property that you owned to avoid probate and, you know, avoiding that because probate is not an easy issue. It is a emotional draining process that we are let's just say consistent victims of because you know you lose a large amount of your home value when in probate and you still have to pay taxes on that even if you win in probate so our goal is to consistently bring professionals you know topics that people don't necessarily get the knowledge of on a consistent basis um, we're also working on programs this year to bring the professionals to the community. Um, we're in the works, you know, hopefully COVID permitting that we can actually go out in the community, have these professional, you know, professionals come and literally on the spot, help them draft up their trust and wills so that, you know, when that time does come, you know, those heirs can stay in that property you know you don't have to have a realtor come in and sell that property and 
you don't worry about paying taxes or going to the court system, right? The court system isn't fun. It doesn't matter if you're going for probate or any other event. It is not a great place to be. So our goal to maintaining home ownership is understanding and making sure people know every day, every step forward is a positive step forward towards home ownership. Dolores, how serious is this problem with probate? Because, um, uh, you know, it sounds like this is a real problem that you guys are addressing as an organization uh, to ensure that uh, African-Americans can retain the wealth that their parents have built over time. Oh, it's amazing. To give you a good example, where I live in View Park, on both sides of me, the owners died. So on one side, the wife was in a convalescent hospital because she had dementia. So they had to get a air, they had to get an attorney for conservatorship. And then the other heirs were fighting. So they had to get two attorneys. So by the end, we had four different attorneys for a probate of two properties. It was incredible. And they did have a trust, but one of the family members, while one of the owners was in the hospital, took the trust and altered it. So see, when you do your trust, you need to make three or four copies and give it to trusted people and put somewhere who the attorney for the, that drew up the trust is where they can be located so that people can find it. On the other side of me, they, there were three heirs and they also, they only had one attorney, so they didn't have a problem with the selling of the property, but they sold it because two of them already had properties. The other one wanted to buy one, so, and they didn't want to live there because it was in such disrepair. See, that's the other problem. We find that by the time most people pass on to the great beyond, their house is in very poor condition. And depending on what neighborhood they live in, they don't know usually that there's a senior program that handymen can come and fix and repair your house and do painting and change your pipes and stuff at a very low cost that you can afford. Hmm. So that's, that's one problem. The other problem we find is that seniors get taken advantage of and the solar panel people come and put it on their tax bill and their relatives don't know anything about it. And then when, because they're secretive, they don't trust anybody. So when they come to find out about it, here's a $50,000 extra bill for solar panels that's in with their tax bill. And then when they go to sell the house, they have to address that issue. So there are all kinds of issues with seniors and dying without a trust and goes into probate. And the lawyers are the ones that make all the money and it gets drawn out. It could take two to three years. Mm, My yeah. best, worst scenario was my son was in the army he had a before he he was on the reserve list so we, he had a listing that was a probate he got drafted back to afghanistan he was gone for a year he came home i'm still going to court with the same probate it makes no sense if you've got five kids that you left they each have an attorney there's five attorneys it's just a nightmare a wow. nightmare uh, Dolores, this sounds like another aspect of fair housing uh, where we need to make sure that people have the information, uh, the education, uh, and the support to not only take care of their properties, but to plan uh, for when there is unexpected or even expected death that we will occur in the family. Now, the, the 1968 Fair Housing Act was supposed to you know, prevent or at least deter uh, discrimination. Uh, and so my question to you both here is, is, is the Fair Housing Act doing its job? Do we, and first of all, let's, say, let's just start, do we still need a Fair Housing Act? Absolutely. Redlining is alive and well, and it's changed its color to green lining, so it blends in with the sidewalk and you don't know it's there. It's still there. I tell you, years ago in the 60s, when I first moved to California, moved to Inglewood, and we had two kids. So we'd go to an apartment complex. Oh, we don't take kids at that age. They're too young. Or we don't take kids at that age. They're too old. So finally, 
typically coming from New Jersey, my husband had to reach into his back pocket and say, will this change your mind? So we had to pay cash to get into an apartment in Inglewood. And now Inglewood has totally changed. So that was just the beginning. And that was in the 60s. Things have not changed. I still have people calling all the time. Yet they call our nonprofit. They call us because they're friends and family where they can't get into an apartment. The prices are so high and they've got all these guidelines, but we definitely still need the Fair Housing Act. Also, LGBTQ plus communities are experiencing a lot of discrimination in housing and also in renting. It's incredible in this 2022 that they're going through this, but they still are. It's amazing that if the owner's in the house and they see the offer being presented, they will, they'll stop it. They, they don't want people in their neighborhood that don't look like them or are not married to different people. They're just crazy. It's insane, but that's the way it is. And we definitely need to keep the Fair Housing Act going. We need to extend it to all types of folks. We are in this together. Black people understand because we've been discriminated against for so long that anybody else that goes through it, we understand right away and we re relate. And that's why we defend and protect them. We pretend and defend rather and protect everyone that we can because we understand the nightmare of not being able to find a place to live, renting or buying. And nowadays, because the prices are so high in, in California, it's even worse because I have home buyers that have been working hard for years, got a good profession and a good salary. We go to make an offer on their pre-approved level and there's 35, 40 offers. So now we're into a whole different realm. It's the expensive home syndrome. And we got that way in the past three, four years. It wasn't like that three, four years ago. Now it's just disheartening and discouraging and people are getting depressed. And that's why a lot of young black people are moving out of California, going to Arizona, going to Atlanta, going to Texas, you know, they're, they're leaving. But then we still have a lot of people coming in, the immigrants. The gentrification people that don't want to be out in the valley anymore. They want to be where the action is because we're a little lively here. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's a mess. <laughs> it's Dolores, a mess. You spoke of, of your personal experience of your husband having to, you know, pay extra cash just to find a place to rent. Um, Leon, do you have any personal experiences? of discrimination in housing? Have you ever been discriminated? And then also, what does fair housing mean to you personally? Yeah, um, you know, I've been a victim of housing discrimination before I even knew it. Um, my parents, when they bought the home that they live in now, they've been in since 1995. Um, there was a clear lack of information. Um, you know, after escrow had closed, they thought that they had paid all their services out, everything like that. They were stuck with a $5,000 bill that they had no idea about. Nobody told them, you know, agent didn't tell them. So my parents had to come up with an extra $5,000. Um, I've applied to apartments where, you know, they see my income, they see my bank statements, and they wanted to call all of my employers, even my past employers. They wanted a copy of my social security card to keep on file. They wanted to, you know, have a criminal check. They wanted to check my friends that would come over and visit me at my new place. They wanted to know who my family was. And this was before I even knew all of that. Um, I've experienced discrimination as a realtor. You know, I've been, you know, door knocking, which is one of the things I don't really like doing anymore because, you know, I've been kicked out because I was a black realtor. You know, they were like, you know, I've been called the N-word in, in, you know, in listing presentations and buyer presentations. I'm like, it's 2019, 2020, you know, people are still believing this. So for me, fair housing is just the ability for people to freely choose where they can live without any restrictions on their social or personal status 
And if they have the money to afford to live somewhere, they should be able to live there, plain and simple. Dolores, have you ever uh, been mistreated because of your race as a real estate professional and out trying to sell or represent uh, buyers? Absolutely, absolutely. There was a time when, again, in Inglewood, I went to an open house and the realtor comes to the door. Oh, the open house is over. It's closed. You can't come in. So there's a lot of that. And in presenting offers, it's amazing that uh, we had to go through all this. And like Leon said, door knocking. I was door knocking in a mid city LA. And uh, of course, it was a 99% white neighborhood and they would slam the door. So I decided, well, if I had something to give them, they wouldn't slam the door. Back then, you could get pot holders with your name on them and your phone number and all kinds of little door uh, bottle openers and everything. So then when we went door knocking, we would always have something in our hand to give away, little sewing kits or stuff. And then they would at least open the door and take it before they slam the door because they don't want to talk to you. But uh, we used to have to have two cards. I have one card with my picture on and that I give out in person because then they see I'm black and another card without the picture that you do with your mail out so they don't know what color you are because my name is Dolores Golden so they don't know what I am. So there you go. It, it's called doing real estate while being black. It's wow. incredible. I've had my agents go to East LA and be called a Negro by Latino people. So it's just, it's everywhere. They don't want us and you just have to pursue and make sure you got a strong back so you can take it because it's going to be out there. We standing on the shoulders of our ancestors that were in cotton fields. So come on now, we come a long way and just don't take it. Keep on, keep on. Well, you're absolutely right. We have come a long way uh, from the uh, cotton fields to the white house and now to the Supreme court. Uh, absolutely. We have, yes. we have come power to the way. people. <laughs> It's amazing to me, though, that, uh, and you're the first realtor that's brought this to my attention, uh, that you have two sets of business cards, one with your picture on it and one without your picture. And that really just kind of tells a story that racism, discrimination because of a person's color or their sexual orientation or their ethnicity, you know, still exists. Now, you know about the Newsday article that really exposed the discrimination that was going on in New Jersey and parts of New York. Long yeah. Island. Yes, Long Island, that's right. And um, a NAR, as a result of that, implemented a whole lot of policies and changes and, and, and educational programs. And, uh, but, you know, I wonder, is that enough? Is that enough? Do you still see that discrimination is still a really big problem or has it calmed down with real estate professionals? Well, I think that first of all, NAR and then on to CAR, they both created diversity offers. I think NAR always had one and I was, was in close contact with them because every time something happened, I'd call them. <laughs> you know me, I do not be quiet. I am going to be the squeaky wheel. So actually they did, uh, CAR came to our organization and asked for input as to who they should make their diversity officer. And we recommended Farrah Wilder. So that was great. And she's doing a lot because she's really smart. She used to be a civil rights attorney. So she's right in there with this realm, but there's still a lot to do. The other thing I, I might say, speaking of the past and then Leon can talk about the future, but I'm from New Jersey. And I knew in Long Island, black people lived in certain parts. It's just like in New Jersey, in my little town that I grew up in, the Italians lived here, the Irish lived here, the Polish people lived there. We didn't have that many Cubans started coming in. That was our first wave of Hispanics, but uh, that's the way it was. And then Haitians started migrating in because you remember this back in the 60s. So the Haitians weren't leaving Haiti. They were still in paradise, enjoying the sand and the sea. But uh, 
that's the way it was. And then I came out to California. And like I said, that discrimination in Inglewood, then my job moved me to Illinois and the suburbs of Chicago. And that was another awakening. There were certain parts of Chicago that black people weren't allowed in after dark. And this is in the 70s, the late 70s. Yeah, Blue Island, Illinois, Cicero, Illinois. I'll never forget them. So we stayed with our relatives in Gary, Indiana, which you know was 99% black and uh, until we could find a house. And we moved into a suburb area that had a mix of people, blacks, Philippines, everything. And that's what we liked. So we grew up, our kids up in that neighborhood where everybody was mixed. That's the way people should do. When you look around your neighborhood and you see us all white, something's wrong with your neighborhood. You need to start rethinking what's going on. Is somebody, not letting black people look at houses in this neighborhood? And do you care? Do you really care? See, that's the other thing. If you wanna keep it lily white, it's gonna stay that way. But you need to look around because some of these people are not paying attention and your grandkids are gonna be beige. So what are you gonna do then? Hmm. That's the awakening. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, Leon, let's, let's talk about the future. You know, so we yeah. have, uh, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers started in 1947 uh, because of the lack of, uh, you know, cooperation, uh, support, advocacy for Black real estate professionals and the African American community. And then, you know, the 1968 Fair Housing Act uh, was supposed to, um, you know, bring some type of uh, equality to housing, fairness in housing, right. so that we could buy and or sell and live where we want to live. Uh, but many believe that um, it was only passed just to stop the burning and looting and, and rioting, that, that it really didn't have then and even now any real teeth to enforce the law. And as a result of that, we see the homeownership rate from when they started tracking it in the early 40s or, or 50s to what it is now the same. We are right. around 40, maybe 41, 42% homeownership rate nationally. Here in California, it's even worse. It's like 35% of African Americans on a home. What, what do we do, Leon, to change the hearts and minds of real estate agents with all the training, all the continuing education, everything that the associations are trying to do but it's not working. At least the numbers show that it's not working. What do we do? Um, first things first, you know, you really have to push and help agents and brokers understand the consequences of this. You know, first things first, you know, Article 10.5 and, you know, the National Association of Realtors, Article 10.5 was created so that people really understand the ramifications of what happens when blatant discrimination is actually proven and shown and that's you know through social media through advertising and marketing materials you know there's um you know i don't know if you guys know this but after july 1st in california you have to as a practicing real estate agent have to hand over a form that tells people that this appraisal has not been done with bias towards you know, personal characteristics like age, gender, race, sexual orientation, religion. And it has to be with every transaction, every appraisal. So it's, you have to put it out there that there are consequences to your actions. And, you know, you no longer can say, hey, I didn't know. Because nobody's going to stand for that. NAR has classes, CAR has classes. Your broker is expected to do training. It's in the continuing education as you renew your license. So you have to know. And it can't just be the, you know, the blatant, you know, answer is I didn't know. You know, ignorance is not the is not the excuse anymore. So you have to be aware of it. And if you're not aware of it, be ready to, you know, lose your license and go to another career. Wow. Losing your license uh, is a pretty serious penalty. 
uh, I was speaking to Ed Delgado uh, with uh, Mortgage Policy Services, and he was saying the penalty for violating the Fair Housing Act is around $21,000, which is, you know, what it was when it started years ago. So it's, it's a drop in the bucket. And that, you know, when do you ever hear of anyone losing their license or being fined uh, for fair housing violations? And yet the evidence is, is, is widespread that fair housing violations are still occurring every day. Uh, and you can just look at, as Dolores has laid out, the composition of neighborhoods to see that redlining and steering is still happening today. Yeah. And I think that um, what needs to be done is, you know, that first, that first violation is 21. Yeah. The second violation, it goes to about 50 to 60,000. It's either that or you lose your license if it's completely blatant. So I think what potentially needs to be done um, is an actual advertising of violators having a website like um C, you know car has a link that you can look at those who've been found guilty of ethics violations i think that we probably will move towards having that for fair housing because fair housing is a much much higher offense and a higher fine than an ethics violation you know ethics violations usually are like 500 to like 2,500 at the most at the state level. Um, you really have to be blatant to lose your license or have it restricted. Like you basically have to make the decision that you don't want to have your face on the website and just not go to, you know, the classes to rectify that situation. So I think that, you know, potentially having it public, you know, public knowledge is a route to potentially go down. Leon, I love that idea. What do you think about that, Dolores? I think that's an excellent idea. And one other thing we need to help aid fair housing in California is in Long Island, they were able to test. They had testers that checked out that Long Island realtor to find out that she was uh, violating Fair Housing Act. But here in California, in order to test, we have to have a bill that says it's okay to test privately without people knowing it. Because if you say, all right, you're on camera and I'm recording you, of course, they're not going to say the truth that they really feel. But we have to, there's a bill I think in, in motion now trying to get the fair housing testers able to record without yeah. signing a waiver. Isn't that Leo? Wow. Yeah, it's, I think it's called the no consent bill. Cause in California, you know, we have, you know, you need consent for everything, consent to record, consent to, you know, put someone on video to publish the video, right? We even at the local associations to even speak at the local associations, you have to sign a form to consent that you, you know, are willing to be recorded and be on the website. So, you know, it's a hard thing to pass because it only takes two letters to not even allow for testing. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, it's consent. You know, we, you know, we fought for it now. Can we fight for it to ensure that we don't need it to make things better? You know, it's a conundrum. Leon, has the uh, website for ethics violators been effective in uh, deterring ethic violations? Yes and no. Um, I think so, because it really puts a light on what people are doing. And I would say no, because not everyone knows about it. So, you know, for me, I learned about it in orientation when I joined my local association. So for those who, you know, don't really pay attention to new member orientation, you know, not many people, you know, talk about it anywhere else. I don't even think some brokers know about it. So I think that it's effective when you end up on there and people know, because it's kind of like a... Uh, you know, like Santa Claus at Christmas time, the naughty list. <laughs> um, but if you don't know about it, then how could you prevent it or end up not being on there by not knowing, you know, your your laws or not even knowing that this exists? Because your photo is on there and it tells you exactly what you did. It tells you you're wow. fine. It tells you everything. It's literally like, it's like, hey, this is what this person did. Try to avoid this and end up like this person. 
Now, is this list sent out to every member of CAR when once it's created? And obviously, the persons who are violators should be aware they're on the list, right? Right. So it's not like, you know, hey, you know, the, the new ethics violator list is out. It's more like, okay, here's the link, you know, just go on and check and you can see exactly what's done. And it's a photo, it's their name, their license number, their brokerage, and a summary of exactly the situation. And what articles did they violate and the consequence of that violation. If you don't want to end up on that website, you can just not show up and you lose your license. You just give it up. So it's, if people knew about it, I think that people would be more cautious. Or you just may have those rebels who just don't care because it's all about the money at the end of the day. So, well, you know, Carr puts out a magazine. Why mm -hmm. isn't it not in the magazine? And they have a high traffic website. Why is it not a banner uh, somewhere on the home page? You know, ethics violators. And, and That's I'm asking a good idea. because I think that you're onto something here. Uh, getting our legislators to make the fair housing laws, you know, uh, more impactful, uh, a, a bigger deterrent, um, it's not working. No, no one's, no. There's, not, there's no movement that I know of to, to strengthen it or to make it more punitive to those who would violate it. And so I think that uh, we need to look to our leaders within the trade associations uh, to be the enforcers. And I think that having banners on the website, having full page ads in their magazines, also writing press releases on a monthly basis to all the national media and local media, I mean, I would be happy to put a full page ad. In fact, you know what? That's what we're going to do. So you, you're hearing it here first, folks. You know, one of the privileges of being the president and CEO of the Powers Now Media. We're going to put the list of violators in all four of our magazines, full page ads. Uh, and hopefully that will be a deterrent to those uh, who are either uh, out there advertising, promoting, selling real estate, you know, that you are being watched. You are being watched and we are taking note when disciplinary action is being taken against you because of your ethics violations and or your fair housing violations. Because we have to do something. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, uh, looking at for sale by owner websites. And I'm seeing that, you know, you're not just have for sale by owner websites, but you have these hedge fund companies who are buying real estate and then, you know, selling it. And they're trying to eliminate the real estate agent. You know, we all know right. this, but right? that's the new movement. Uh, but I'm concerned that uh, with the advent of technology, ask Google, you know, YouTube, Facebook, everybody, and the whole DYI movement, everybody thinks that they could do it better than a realtor, right? <laughs> And so, uh, do you believe that for sale by owners are at a greater risk of violating fair housing laws innocently or even intentionally because they don't have, number one, a license, they haven't received any kind of training whatsoever, uh, and they have no idea on the law as relates to the practice of real estate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah, fair. Uh, the, uh, FISBOs, as we call them, for sale by owners, they can discriminate against who they take an offer from. Absolutely, because they see the person and they don't want to sell to somebody. And that way, no one knows about it. Plus the fact that if they're doing a for sale by owner, they don't have all the tools. They don't have the disclosures. Even though they're selling it without an agent, they're still... California disclosures that you have to give to any home buyer that's buying a home that tells them about the, uh, what's that tax, that, they, that supplemental tax. That's something yep. we have in bold writing because so many people would buy their house and didn't put any money aside. So when that first year they get that supplemental tax bill, they think, oh, well, that's in with my mortgage and they throw it in the trash. And the next thing you know, they're in delinquency with the tax assessor. So there are important things, key things. It's just like the uh, natural hazard disclosure report we give people. They don't know anything about it, nor do they care. But 
if they find out after they bought the house, there's there was an oil well nearby and there's contaminated soil, they can take them to the cleaners if they could find them. See, that's the other problem. We, these owners leave California and go somewhere. Nobody knows how to find them. Yeah. So that's a major problem. Yeah. I mean, it's without a doubt, it's a huge problem. I mean, it, it's literally says it in the title for sale by owner. Like, you know, you you go through the ringer when you would buy something, you know, you go to, if you were going to buy like a, a pair of shoes or a pool table on offer up from somebody, wouldn't you want to go above and beyond for a house? You know, would you, you know, our whole goal is to avoid being sued, right? California is probably the state that sues the most people for everything, you know, breathing the same air or anything of that nature, <laughs> right? So it's, do you really want to put yourself at risk by going to someone who's going to just put a sign outside the door and said, I'm selling this home myself? Where did you get your value for your house? What kind of condition is it? Do you have termite damage? Every house is termite damage, right? What are your property taxes like? Am I going to, you know, for every sale, the property tax percentage does not transfer over. You get assessed on the value that you purchase a property on. The only people who can really know that are realtors. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, they're, they're gonna try and filter us out. Every great profession mm -hmm. has a disruptor. The question yeah. is, how long mm -hmm. does the disruptor disrupt before the disruptor gets disrupted? <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like a tongue twister. It is. Right. It's literally, you one. know. The disruptor comes in because it's only meant to be for a certain for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And then someone comes to disrupt the disruptor. And it's up to the disruptor to not be disrupted and let the industry go back to itself. So it's honestly, I don't know why for sale by owners exist. I see, you know, the purpose because they want to save money, which greed. puts more in their, you know, it puts more in their pockets. It's greed, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. too much volatility. It's too much vulnerability for anybody to be happy with. Now, Dolores, they might say, no, it's, it's greed on behalf of realtors. You guys are charging 5 6 7%. That's just too much money. We're worth every penny. Every and then penny. some. And then some. What we do is incredible, um, including walking the dog chasing the cat we we do everything i had a property listed once and the dog got out and i'm like oh me and, and the repair people running down the street trying to catch the dog <laughs> so we do a lot we do a lot we do. you know it's what incredible about, what do you think about this so i believe that uh because of what i've just stated about you know, the risk and what you have kind of elaborated on, the risk associated with trying to sell your property your own. I believe that the state should get involved. Um, you know, in fact, I used to believe the state should get involved in setting commissions because, you know, you have agents out there who will sell a house for $50, you know, or a thousand dollar flat fee. Uh, so, and it's just, it's really destroying the professionalism in our industry, these low discount brokers. Uh, who don't do really anything, obviously, because they're not really getting paid to do anything. But that's another issue. I'm thinking that there should be a permit required if a person wants to sell their home on their own. And that permit would only be issued after they've taken a series of courses on real estate practice, that they have taken a series of courses on uh, fair housing, uh, so that they cannot claim ignorance if they do uh, discourage or discriminate in selling their property. And of course, uh, pay fees, significant fees, uh, because the state would, would administrate that. And, uh, and then they would also come under the, the purview of the state, uh, even though they're not you know, a licensed real estate agent, they're given a permit for a period of say six months to sell their home. What do you think about something like that? I think that's an excellent idea. Absolutely. That way they would have some kind of uh, skin in the game that they could be gone after if they didn't do the right thing. The problem yeah. is they think that this is the open season. They can do whatever they want to because it's their house. It is their house. But when you sell it to a consumer, the consumer has rights. It's just like the uh, airline traveler's bill of rights. People 
should have rights. If you're buying a house, you shouldn't just be out there with some crazy person selling the house by yourself and tell you, oh, I put that roof on yesterday. And then after you buy the house, it starts leaking because you didn't go up there on a ladder like who would and check yourself. Yeah. You know, there's just really sad things that happen when somebody buys a house for sale by owner and you don't know what's really happening. Right. And you're not getting the wise counsel no of counsel. a real estate uh, professional uh, to guide you. You're not you don't have an advocate to protect you uh, from sellers who may uh, want to, you know, play games or not fully disclose everything that's going on. I love the idea of the home buyer bill of rights. And, you know, this is something that I'm in communication now with my representatives. This is an idea that I'm floating with them uh, to hopefully become a bill here in the state of California. Maybe other uh, states will follow uh, because I believe as we develop uh, in terms of technology, I mean, everybody's online, all, all this business being done online, people are smarter, at least they think they are smarter because they can ask Google. Uh, and so people are trying to take on more and more of doing things themselves to so-called save money. At the same time though, there is a growing movement of people who, because they're kind of overwhelmed with all the information because of the ability to research themselves online, that they realize they don't have the depth of understanding and our practice and experience to take this on. And so they value even more today than perhaps ever a seasoned professional, educated, certified experience to guide them to the process. So it's kind of a two-edged sword that's happening on, you know, one end, right. the DYI, the other end say, geez, I'm not touching this at all. I'm going to go find me a qualified agent. Yeah. And I don't think people realize that, you know, realtors bring value. And it's not just the value of avoiding legal trouble. It brings property value. So you're when you hire a realtor, you're only paying a portion of the increased property value because we did research on the property. So it's extra money that you're going to be making no matter what. So it's like, would you rather pay a realtor, you know, pay nothing on this amount or pay realtor a little bit out of the extra money that you're making. Right. So, you know, I think it's not really put that way enough because that's exactly what we do. We bring value and we know the value of your property because that's our job. Like if we don't know the property, the value of your property, why are we even at your house? That's right. That's right. And then the other thing is, if you were for sale, for sale by owner and you're moving out of state, you didn't have a real estate advisor telling you that escrow is going to hold a third of your money for pro property tax in the state of California. Withholding. Hmm. Withholding. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Had a realtor, we would have told you, you better go let Aunt Sarah down the street. Use, you, use her address or something. I never said that, but you know. <laughs> That's what you get. You get what you get. You can really? lose a lot of money. And then they are, oh, I thought I was getting a hundred thousand dollars and I only got 60. Where's my mm -hmm. other 30? Well, you can collect it after you file your taxes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, knowledge is power and the power is now. It right? is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Many people are just being uh, victimized because they simply are not aware. First, we have the law itself. People are not aware. And we have those who are aware but don't care. Uh, and as it relates to people not caring, you know, what do we do uh, outside, you know, outside of you know, taking licenses? Do we really want to do that? No. Do we really want to make people pay fines? No. We just want them to do the right thing. So how do we make the Fair Housing Act a real deterrent where a person is literally afraid to violate the law? And is it as it stands right now, uh, Dolores and Leon, a deterrent or is it not? I don't Ooh. think it's a deterrent, but I think peer shaming would help a lot too. 
Yeah. Yeah, peer shaming because they they want to be, oh, I did this and I sold that and I've got 17 in escrow. Yeah, right. Picture that. And you've got one person that you discriminated against, then what's wrong with you? It's it's peer shaming. We need to bring peer shaming. Like you said, Eric, if you put that ethics violation in 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 the Power is Now magazine, then peers would see it and they'd say, oh, you did that? Oh my God. And I used to think you were so wonderful. Now I find that you're really an undercover bigot. So, okay, let's see. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Well, we're going to do it. I can, I would agree with that as well. I think, you know, it's a real hit to the ego. Um, You know, they naturally say that we're, you know, pretty big, you know, like, a lot of realtors have big personalities there's, there's nothing that makes someone come down to earth than a public display of their wrongdoing mm. yeah well um consider it done uh may issue all four magazines all right. uh, we will be um advertising uh the violators and, you know, if there is some type of litigation going on uh, in which a person has been uh, charged as guilty of a fair housing uh, violation, then we're going to publicize that as well. That would take more research because there's no kind of governing body, right? There's no, that, this, is, this is another problem with the enforcement of it. Now, the other thing, too, that I, I want, I'm going to get back to for sale by owners um, you know, because here, you know, ultimately, uh, anyone selling real estate uh, had to get a license, right? And so they bring to that profession their unconscious bias, right? And we see this happening uh, with the appraisal controversy right now. Appraisers having unconscious bias, appraising property for less than uh, what they are truly worth because of the the ethnicity or color of the, of, the, of the person who owns the property. And we see uh, for sale by owners, because of the lack of training, licensing, what have you, it would just be natural for them to bring their unconscious bias and selling their own property, which I think we do need a, a home buyer's bill of rights and some type of permanent licensing. What do we do to, you know, rem- can't we, can we remove unconscious bias how do you change the hearts and minds of real estate professionals? I believe one way to do it is for us to get together and to get to know one another. Because, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of training happening. NAR led the way with Newsday's article and all the, the Fair Haven and what have you. And then, you know, CAR with the diversity officer and other states are doing things. There's a whole lot of training. But there's not a whole lot of uh, inter- um, I would say, interaction uh, between uh, the minorities within these associations. The very fact that we have NARAP, we have NAREP, we have ARIA, and they all have their respective conferences, they all have their respective agendas, they all have their respective chapters, and, and you go to any one of these associations, whether they're conferences and our meetings, and majority of people there look just like the organization that exists, I believe part of the solution would be greater efforts towards getting to know one another and work together. Some type of real strategic plan where ARIA and NARAP and NARAP literally come up with a real plan where agents do business with one another, get to know one another, engage one another, you know, something something like that. What do you think about that, Leon? Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that uh, one of the ways or reasons unconscious bias can go away is experience and understanding. Um, You know, they say that's the, you know, knowledge is, you know, the key to all doors, right? If you have knowledge and understanding of what each of these, you know, you know, aspects of real estate happens for each and every minority group, then you can kind of learn from it you know we we're all here to learn from each other and help the industry and help the community because we're you know forward people facing it's just that 
you know, we naturally, human nature, flock to people that we have a lot in common with. It's, you know, it's, it's been said in psychology and everybody says it, it, no matter what you go to people that, you know, you, people that look like you talk like you from the same area, like the same thing. It's, it's a given. It's uncomfortable for us to be around people that we may not perceive to know or have a lot in common with. So putting that experience together, having, you know, a, a conference together, you know, encouraging, you know, encouraging people from that other community to come in, giving them time to speak and, you know, letting them know about what, it, what an honor it is to be here. It's all about just being open and having that experience because if you don't have the experience, you're never going to know. Yeah, it's never going to change. And we have to be intentional about it, right? We have to be strategic about it because yeah. we're dealing with hearts and minds and emotions and deep-rooted cultural experiences that come from our parents and our grandparents. That's, that's taught, that's part of our DNA. How do you change that? You know? Yeah. How do you change it? Dolores, what are your thoughts? Well, actually, I because I'm so old, <laughs> I was here when Narev and Aria formed, and I know the, the leaders, Alan Okamoto and Alan Chang, also Jerry from uh, Narev, and they all invited everybody, and NAR makes sure that whenever they have their conferences, they're at the table too, and NARAB also. So they're all going to each other's conferences, but that's the leaders, see, that's the leaders. So it has to get out to the membership because I remember when I was in women's council, if we had to go to a conference and you had to have a roommate and you were not allowed to pick your friend as your roommate. So they gave you just a roommate. So when you got there, you, you were rooming with somebody that didn't look like you and vice versa. And you get to know other people. I remember rooming with a lady and she was from rural Minnesota. So that's how you get to know people. And with us being in the real estate business, we need to do referrals all over the state and the country. So you need to get to know people of all kinds, all kinds of people. You really need to know that. You need to know people in rural areas because you never know when you're going to get a listing referral that's in some rural area of Mississippi or something. So you don't know. You need to know everybody. And because of my background, I worked for an airline and they had that same philosophy. When they sent you on a business trip, you were gonna have a roommate and you didn't get to pick. So you had to get to know people. So I already was used to that. So, you know, people that aren't used to that, that's a problem. If they grew up in an all black community, went to all black school, and then all of a sudden they're the only black person in the room, then they might, if they don't have a, a like Leon said, a big personality, they might get a little frightened or insecure. I was insecure when I was maybe six years old and that's over. That party is over. So I can't tell you how many places I've been where I'm the only one in the room that looks like me. So I don't care. I'm just getting my martini and roaming around the room. I could care less. So everybody will know me before they leave. And sometimes that's a good thing. Then you get more recognition and then you get referrals, which turns into money. So I think people need to get out of that comfort zone and find out if you get to know somebody and know their story, listen to their story, sit down with them. It's amazing yeah. when you sit down with somebody, what you find out that you really have in common. And that's a good thing. So we need to promote, and I could actually see that happening, uh, Eric, a big conference with everybody. NARAB, NARAB, ARIA, and us, all of us together. I could see that happening. Soon as COVID is out of the way, I'm sure they would all be happy. I know those leaders to have one big fat day or two right. together. Yeah, it should be a week uh, because it's gonna take time when you have, I mean, NAREP is the largest minority trade association in the country, right? Uh, 44,000, I believe, strong. So uh, it, would, it, it needs to be a week. And 
and it needs to go beyond leadership because they have they do go out of their way to reach out to one another at the leadership level you know come to our conferences and and they do do that i mean but um it has to happen with a general population of agents in their respective organizations and um uh that's that's really where the effort to you know work together uh the efforts to cooperate with one another uh to not discriminate that's where it's going to start uh and, and until we do that uh i don't see any other way to change the hearts and minds of real estate professionals who are discriminating unconsciously who are uh to to stop and then when you look at the California, I mean, we have these pockets, all Latino, all Asian, all Black. I mean, that's evidence in and of itself that unconscious bias by real estate agents still exists and by for those who sell their properties on their own. Uh, we need a strategy with real intention by the major trade associations, the minority trade associations for integration. It's almost, it reminds me of, you know, school busing. You know, to me, and integration. You know, it needs to. Where it became a matter of law to integrate, and it needs to be a matter of policy, and uh, uh, it needs to be real intent, real strategy around integration. And I think that's how we, in the private sector, at the trade level, uh, take the lead in helping to uphold the goals and the ideals of fair housing. And you know, Eric, I've just remembered something else uh, in gentrification. One of my new neighbors was Asian and then they had to move after a year to Orange County, to Irvine. And he called the, us back and he says, do you know, I went to those white communities and they were so unreceptive and unresponsive. He said, I never saw such evil mean people in my life. So we had to move into the Asian community of Irvine. So we would feel comfortable because we have young kids. We didn't want them to be subjected to that. So right. it's just, it's undercover too. Yes, yeah. yes. It's in the yes. shadows, it needs to come out. They need to come out of the closet with that discrimination. And we need to call it. We need to call it, absolutely right. The new undercover discrimination is encoding, right? Uh, so that's another discussion. We are way past time. I really appreciate you guys uh, <laughs> taking time with me today. And I want to get your final thoughts uh, on discrimination and uh, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, let's start with you, Dolores. And before you do, again, I, I want people to know who you are and how to reach out to you. If they're looking for a seasoned professional real estate broker in L.A., you need to call Dolores Golden. That's right. Call Dolores Golden at 213-718-2305. And I look at my email all day long. So if you go on my Facebook or my website, you can find me. I am available. And that's how I look for referral agents too. So make sure you're visible. And I think that we need to start calling out the secret undercover discrimination when we see it and bring that peer shaming to these people. But don't let them go unseen. We need to call them. When we get these complaints from our consumers, some of them are elderly and they're not computer savvy and they can't go online and file a complaint with HUD, but we need to help them. Yeah. Leon. Yeah. Um, my name is Leon Townsend. Uh, you can, my phone number is 626-372-9374. Um, for me, I just think that, you know, it's something that's still here. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't here, then we wouldn't have to do all these things. There wouldn't need to be documents and amendments and updates to acts if discrimination wasn't present. If it's if it doesn't sound right to you, it's discrimination. So don't be afraid to speak up, ask for help, and we'll make sure that something happens in the right way for you. That's how I feel, and I think that's how it just has to be. Thank you, Leon and Dolores, for spending time with me today to talk about this very important topic of fair housing. Thank you again, Dolores Golden and Leon Townsend. I really appreciate 
uh, their time today and talking about the Fair Housing Act. And folks, if you're looking for a great real estate agent in Los Angeles, you have them both uh, to reach out to to support your home buying needs. And for those of you who are in the industry, um, aren't you encouraged? There are people like uh, Leon and Dolores who are true advocates of home ownership and of fair housing. We need more agents to be advocates of fair housing and to not to discriminate, but to encourage uh, fair housing with their sellers, if they're representing sellers, uh, and to um, just be an example by how they treat their customers. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the show. There's more to come. The 2022 Fair Housing Series of, for, 19, for the 1968 Fair Housing Act is on and happening right now. Please remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Uh, please download our mobile app. It's Power Is Now TV. You can watch all of our programming from your phone. Go to our website, thepowersnow.com. Check out our magazines and also check out our other shows. Homebuyer town halls are, are happening all over the country, folks. We will be in all 50 states soon with our homebuyer town hall show. If you're a seasoned real estate professional and you would like to have your own show, reach out to the Power Is Now Media. Thank you for watching. Remember, we are at our best and we maximize our success when we act now. The power is now.